good morning, folks. How are you on this beautiful day? It's gorgeous out there. So, well, today is June 7th, and the day that the Lord has made. Let's get to the uh, announcements. Uh, there will be Passionate Ministry Food Handout on the 15th at 9 a.m. Uh, that same Tuesday is Zoom Fellowship at 7 p.m. And then Wednesday, uh, we've got Bible study, and it's uh, a dual process here. Pastor will be at church, so those that, of you who want to come to church and be in person, uh, you can take part in the Bible study there. If you want to stay home and watch it from home, it's going to be a Zoom session at 7 p.m. And Pastor sends out uh, email links to all those things. Uh, there will be no ladies meeting this month. So ladies, uh, the month off. And I do have a thank you note here. It says, uh, Dear Oakley Community Church, thank you for your generous scholarship. I was very happy and excited to learn that I was selected as the recipient of your scholarship. I'm grateful to have a great community that supports young people in their educational journey. Thank you again. I will take full advantage of the opportunity. Sincerely, Trent Devereaux. So I'll put the card up and he also sent uh, graduation pictures. We'll put it up on the bulletin board for everybody to see. And Sylvia's got a picture of the other recipient. Both of them. Oh, okay. They both on the wall with the rest of them. All right. So that wall's going to get pretty full. We'll have to get a bigger wall. <laughs> okay. So is there any other announcements that need to be made at this time? Any birthdays? We had one in the first service. Chuck Fowler. Chuck Fowler had a birthday, and we sang happy birthday to him. Any anniversaries? No? Okay. So, it's time for our invocation, and going along with the uh, pastor's uh, subject this morning, I have a little bit different uh, invocation. Uh, the first one is the First Amendment to our Constitution which says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for re a redress of grievances. So, as we all know, our First Amendment's been under attack for some time from different directions and different uh, sources and in the past week or so we had now can add the Supreme Court to that. It's too bad the founding fathers didn't include uh, the Supreme Court in that First Amendment because they left them out. So if you want to stand we will pray. I have a prayer here, a um, book that's half and finished, half and finished. And the title of this prayer is Tani Jesus Tulumi, which roughly translated is Today Jesus We Come. So, blessed Jesus, at thy word we are gathered all here to thee. Let our hearts and souls be stirred now to seek and love and fear thee. By thy teachings and sweet and holy, drawn from earth to love thee solely. All our knowledge, sense, and sight lie in deepest darkness shrouded till thy spirit breaks our night with the beams of truth unclouded. Thou alone, O God, can win us. Thou must work all good within us. Glorious Lord, thyself in part, light of light from God proceeding, open thou our ears and heart. Help us by thy spirit's pleading. Hear the cry thy people raises. Hear and bless our prayers and great praises. Amen. Amen. So, and pastor is going to come and lead us in song. Oh, uh, Kathleen and Walter 
are in Indiana today celebrating their one of their grandchildren's graduation. Right. So they're in an open house and they're enjoying themselves and I will tell you that uh, you're stuck with me. Take your hymnals, turn to 596 and let's sing Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus.
Okay, it's time for our worship and tithes and offerings. And again, it's uh, been nice during this hiatus that um, mm -hmm. the good folks of this church have been faithful in supporting the church. So, Charlene, would you like to pray for the offerings? Thank you, dear Lord. During this time that's been uh, quite a challenge for each one of us, we want to take time always to remember the good uh, the good day you have blessed us with and the days ahead, the days past. But we thank you now, Lord, that we are able to gather in a smaller congregation if that's what it has to be. And we just give you thanks for the uh, way that the uh, monies have come in and that we are still able to do what needs to be done for our church and for our God. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Uh, praises and concerns, you see on the back of your bulletin, the uh, praises that we have been uh, thanking the Lord for, and of course the prayer request. Um, we continue to pray for Barb um, Bear and Don. Um, Barb is going to be transferred to uh, a rehab facility in Saginaw. Um, she's not doing good, so keep Barb and Don in prayer. Crystal? You know, we've been praying for a revival, and usually a revival means something bad's going to happen to bring people to a revival, which has happened with the coronavirus and that, and then, you know, with churches closing down, hope they were hoping to silence us. Well, I was watching a um, Christian program, and through the streaming services, hundreds have called in to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. So that is a praise. praise God. And now I'm praying for healing and peace. Yeah. <laughs> yep. The word of God will not return void, right? And new technology is spreading it even faster. Sylvia? Yes, I'd like for a release for my son, Stephen. He has some problems that looks like it could be Parkinson's disease. And I just pray God is merciful and it is not. Okay, let's lift Stephen up at this time. So, Charlie? We got a call. Well, Charlie ended up calling his brother last night. He checks in about every other day with his brother Pete in Midland. And Sally had the serious surgery about a week and a half or two weeks ago. She was doing better, but now yesterday she was having a very bad day. She had part of her bowl removed, and it's not going well. She is home, but not doing well at all. So we need to pray for Sally and also Charlie's brother, Pete. He has problems also. Okay. Lift them up to the Lord in prayer. So, um, also, on the bottom here, you get uh, six new names of orphans to pray for. Uh, please pray for them uh, when you think of them. Uh, they need the Lord, and I'm sure that Pastor Peter is teaching them and leading them, but we all know it's a personal decision, right? So pray that the Holy Spirit will work. So at this time, Trudy? Yeah, I think we need to put our police officers on our prayer list oh, because yes. Yes. there's yes. a lot of them um, being killed, being wounded. Uh, a lot of them are uh, put in the force because of all the troubles that come forward from the violence. And some of them are taking early retirement. They want to disband the police. It's like, what, what is this going to be? Yeah. Uh, You've got to pray hard for them. Satan is hard at work. And there are people in this nation that are in league with him. And we got to pray that this spiritual battle is won by the righteous. <clears throat> okay? So. I would like pray for my friend Amy Hampshire. Her husband passed away yesterday, and it was a very hard situation. So, what's your name? Special friends. What's your name? Joan Grower. Okay. So, pray for that. For Keith. I'd like to pray, pray for the families of Kendra Gross and Jim Culler, young people, uh, relatively young in my age, uh, <laughs> old students of mine who both passed away this week. Kendra was 49, been in a coma for 34 years, and Jim Culler, uh, cancer, early 60s. Both wonderful people. A lot of family 
always hurt when that need prayer. So, Trudy? Um, Brent's not here because uh, one of his drivers passed away. I think he was like 59. And his first name was Roland. I don't know. I don't know him personally, but he was driving for our company and uh, the Art Express, I think. So now Fred's doing that right now. Okay. Okay. So try to only mercies for Fred and Kathleen and Walter and prayers for families that are suffering loss. So the pastor's going to come and lead us in a chorus and then in prayer.
my God, my God. As we confess our sins before you, we ask that you would forgive us, please. But more than forgiveness, Father, forgiveness does no good if there's not repentance. And we're asking that you would bring revival and that you would help us as a nation to repent and that you would change things. Father, help us. Lord, we need it. Father, if, if you don't step in and do something, if you don't, then we will no longer be a people. Lord, I remind you that America was your creation. It was founded on the principles of your word. And Father, you blessed it. Lord, we realize also that this is not the first moral, moral crisis we as a nation have faced. But Father, it is the one that we're facing now and that we as Christians beg, simply beg, intercede for ourselves, for our nation, for our children, for our institutions. Please, God, bring revival. Be in our world, oh Father, our brothers and sisters around the world are being persecuted and they're struggling with the same virus and they're struggling with famine. Be with them. Father, give them courage. Help them to stand. Help them to stand with such loving spirits that their persecutors are seeing the, the love of God and turn to you. Be with our president. Be with our governor. Be with our legislators, our judges, our civil servants. Oh, Father, please. We ask that righteousness would rain down among them. Father, please, heal us. Be with our local officials. Be with us as a church. Help us, Lord to be on mission here in this area. Father, we ask that we would be effective in our mission field here and that men and women, boys and girls, would come to know you because of the outpost that you have here. Above all, Father, above all, please be with us in the remainder of this service. May everything that's said, everything that's sung, everything that's done, may it be to your name's honor and glory. We'll thank you for it. For we've asked it in the saving name of Jesus. cannot be uprooted. A wife of a noble character is her husband's crown, but a disgraceful wife is like decay in his bones. The plans of the righteous are just, but the advice of the wicked is deceitful. Mm -hmm. okay. So, special music this morning is with Pastor and Lucy, and then we'll have uh, just the kids and a message from the Word.
was talking to somebody this week, and I, we were talking about some of the things we're faced with, and I looked at him and I told him, I'll tell you though, I've read the back of the book, and we win. Amen. 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 We're going to sing a song that Lucy and I grew up with. It's called, I'm on the winning side. Oh. 
across the congregation. I think that, I, did anybody know that song besides me? Huh? Nobody had heard it. What Bible school did you go to? <laughs> the story comes from the sixth chapter of the book of Daniel. Darius reorganized his kingdom. <clears throat> he appointed 120 governors to administer all the parts of his realm. Uh, over them were three vice regents, one of whom was Daniel. Uh, the governors reported to the vice regents who made sure that everything was in order for the king. But Daniel, brimming with spirit and intelligence, um, so completely outclassed the other uh, vice regents and governors that the king decided to put him in charge of the entire kingdom. The vice regents and governors got together to find some old scandal or skeleton in Daniel's life that they could use against him, but they couldn't dig up anything. He was totally exemplary and trustworthy. Uh, they could find no evidence of negligence or misconduct, uh, so they finally gave up and said, uh, we're, never, we're never going to find anything against him, this Daniel, unless we cook up something uh, religious. Vice regents and governors conspired together and then went to the king and said, King Darius, live forever. Uh, we've convened your vice regents, governors, and all your uh, leading officials and have agreed that the king should issue uh, the following decree. For the next 30 days, no one is to pray to any god or moral, uh, mortal except you. O oh, king, anyone who disobeys will be thrown into the lion's den. Issue a decree, O oh, king, and make it unconditional as it, as it is written in stone like the laws of the Medes and Persians. King Darius signed the decree. Uh, when Daniel learned that the decree had been signed and posted, he continued to pray just as he had always done. Uh, his house had windows in the upstairs, and they opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he knelt there and uh, in prayer, thanking and praising his God. The conspirators came and found him praying, asking God for help. They went straight to the king and reminded him of the royal decree he had signed. Did you not, they said, sign a decree forbidding anyone to pray to any god or man except uh, for you for the next 30 days, anyone caught doing this would be thrown into the lion's den? Absolutely, said the king, written in stone like the laws of the Medes and the Persians. Then they said, Daniel, one of the Jewish exiles, ignores you, O king, and defiles uh, and, and uh, defies your decree. Three times a day he prays. The king, at this, the king was very upset and tried his best to get Daniel out of the fix he put him in. He worked at it all day long. But then the conspirators were back. Remember, O king, uh, it's the law of the Medes and Persians that the king's decree can never be changed. The king caved in and ordered Daniel brought and thrown in the lion's den. But he said to Daniel, your God, to whom you are so loyal, is going to get you out of this. A stone slab was placed over the opening of the den. Uh, the king sealed the cover with his signet ring and the signet rings of all the nobles, fixing Daniel's fate. The king then went back to his palace. He refused supper. He couldn't sleep. He spent the night fasting. At daybreak, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. As he approached the den, he called out anxiously, Daniel, servant of the loving, living God, has your God, whom you have uh, you served so loyally, uh, saved you from the lions? O king, live forever, said Daniel. My God has sent his angel who closed the mouths of the lions so that they would not, even, not hurt me. I've been found innocent before God and also before you, O king. 
I've done nothing to harm you. When the king heard these words, he was happy. Uh, he, uh, he ordered Daniel to be taken up out of the den. When he was hauled up, there wasn't a scratch on him. He had trusted God. Then the king commanded the conspirators who had informed on Daniel be thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. Before they hit the floor, the lions had them in their jaws, tearing them to pieces. King Darius published this proclamation to every race, color, and creed on earth. Peace to you, abundant peace. I decree that Daniel's God shall be worshipped and feared in all parts of my kingdom. He is the living God, world without end. His kingdom never fails. Uh, he is, his rule continues eternally. He is Savior and Rescuer. He performs astonishing miracles in heaven and on earth. He saved Daniel from the power of the lions. From then on, Daniel was treated well during the reign of Darius and also in the following reign of Cyrus the Persian. Boys and girls, remember, do right even if it's against the law. Remember, God loves you. Jesus loves you. The church loves you. And so do I. Amen? change our constitutional form of government. Uh, on the other hand, and another thing, we have in our community a barber who is uh, defying the governor's decree on barbers not cutting hair. Um, and uh, he's doing it because uh, he feels that uh, the decree is uh, unfair or or wrong. Uh, furthermore, you could sense it in the society. There's increasing frustration with the suspension of our constitutional rights and uh, the uneven application of uh, the reopening rules. Given this set of circumstances, um, I feel it's time, I believe I've been led, to see what scripture has to say about protesting civil disobedience and rioting. Okay? Um, we're, we're looking at scripture. This is not a political statement. You know, I can't avoid uh, intersections with politics with this because it's, uh, it's where we are. But, not talking about politics, the question is, what's the Bible say? That's the real question. So, let's, uh, let's go on from there. Uh, in terms of civil disobedience, there are three well-known acts of civil disobedience um, in, in Scripture. Uh, the first one is our text, uh, Daniel in the Den of Lions. Now, uh, and the Scripture that is pivotal in this is Daniel 6.10. Uh, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Now I want you to notice some things. It was intentional. Okay? 
it was a violation of the the law was immoral. And finally, it was nonviolent. Okay? That's where we are. Uh, the second one is the three Hebrew children. And uh, the story here, of course, I think we're all pretty much familiar with, is that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar set up a golden image uh, on the plain of Shinar and uh, had uh, uh, and said, okay, when uh, all the music sounds, everybody's supposed to fall down before it and worship it. And, uh, and so the music sounded, uh, everybody fell down but Jack, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and just like with Daniel, political adversaries ran to the king, oh, king, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't bow. Well, the king got mad, pulled him in and said, okay, boys, Maybe you didn't understand. I'm going to give you another chance. And uh, if you bow, if you bow down, uh, no no harm, no foul. But if you don't, into the fiery furnace. And the key verse here is uh, Daniel chapter 13, verses 6 through 8, 16 through 18, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O oh, king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O oh, king, we will not serve your gods or worship the gold image you've set up. Again, notice it was intentional. Notice that it was uh, nonviolent, and notice that they were willing to uh, suffer the consequences of their actions. Okay. Uh, the third one, taken from the New Testament, is the disciples being forbidden to teach in Jesus' name. Now, the, the story here is that after Jesus was resurrected, uh, the, there was a huge revival in the city of Jerusalem. The disciples are preaching in Jesus' name, and the uh, high priest, the chief priest, the key people are really upset about this. And they haul the disciples in and they tell them, look, you stop teaching in that name. Well, they didn't. And so, they sent out the temple guard, they arrested them, they threw them in jail uh, for the night. Funny funny story. They're in jail. But guards on the outside of the door. The door is locked. The angel comes in, takes them out of the, out of the jail. And they're outside. And as soon as the temple opens, they're back out in the temple teaching Jesus. Okay. Court comes into session. Sanhedrin says, bring those, bring those criminals up here. So they sent the, the bailiff down to get the guards, two guards by the door. They unlock the door and they open it up and there's nothing in there. I'm, I'm thinking and say, this is almost like a Keystone Cops movie, you know. There's nobody in there. And they, well, they said, oh, they're gone. The guards were there, the door was locked, but there's nobody in the inside and they're going, about that time, one of, the, one of the police officers from the temple comes running in breathlessly saying, uh, uh, those guys that you threw into jail uh, last night, they're out in the temple preaching still. Well, so they sent the temple guard out. And the scripture says, they escorted them peacefully because they were afraid of the crowds. So they bring them in, and they're before the almighty... Um, uh, judges august situation and the and the uh, high priest says to them did we not tell you to cease teaching in that name and here's the here's the key scripture <laughs> peter and the other apostles replied <laughs> i love this we ought to obey god rather than Okay, 
And what's interesting is, uh, if, you, if you follow the rest of that paragraph through, he goes on, he says, Jesus, you hung on a tree, you killed him, but, we re but he rose again, and we're witnesses of that, and you're responsible for his death. They were livid. They beat him and sent him on their way. But what we get from this is, number one, it was intentional. Number two, they communicated what they needed to do. Number three, it was nonviolent. And number four, they uh, uh, oh, uh, stated they had their reasons. So that's what we got. Well, let's, let's pull all of it together. Let's just kind of summarize the characteristics of biblical civil disobedience. It is opposed to the law on moral grounds. They communicated it to the authorities. The violation was intentional. They didn't just stumble into it. They did it on purpose. The opposition was nonviolent. And they were willing to accept the consequences of their actions. Really, three three areas in this in this area that we talk. It's kind of a continuum. Uh, on the the extreme right is protest. Now, a protest is a peaceful assembly for the purpose of expressing anger, opposition, or agreement with legislation, an event, or an activity in the community. Okay, when when you've got that, the peaceful assembly is guaranteed by the First Amendment. We can peacefully assemble, uh, and that, that is our right. Um, uh, for example, one of them, would, uh, an example would be a group of people standing outside an abortion clinic and calling to the people who are going in, trying to persuade them for staying out. That's peaceful assembly. And there have been uh, people who have tried to get them run off and whatever, Courts say, no, nope, no, nope, protected by the First Amendment. Um, the peaceful protest over uh, George Floyd's death is absolutely understandable. I haven't met anybody that hasn't looked at that and said, that was uncalled for. That's unconscionable. And, and this is not America. That's not uh, the way America does, does justice. However, the problem I've had with these protests is the hypocrisy behind them. Uh, for instance, nobody, nobody has protested. Um, is it David Dunn? Is that his name? Uh, David Dorn, the police officer, the St. Louis police officer that was killed by rioters. He was a black officer. He was killed by rioters, and that wasn't reported. Uh, we don't have people standing with signs out in the street saying, justice for David Dorn. What's more than that, what is not reported, there have been somewhere between 7 and 10 killings by the rioters. There's a 22-year-old mother with a 3-year-old kid who was shot. She was, just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. She wasn't participating or anything. Different ones. But do you see the news even reporting it? Uh, do you see any, uh, when we start talking about wanting justice for George Floyd, how about justice for the shop owners that have lost their business and lost their livelihood for good? How about someone standing up and protesting that? Okay. The problem that I have with the protest is not, are they justified? Uh, what, what happened was horrible. But, let's quit being so hypocritical. And when other things are going on, let's call attention to that too. This is America. We live by law. We don't go around, shoot people, destroy things. Um, burn police stations, burn cars, that's not, that's not protest. That's not what we got. 
the uh, next on this scale towards the middle is a thing that is called civil disobedience. Uh, civil disobedience is a public, nonviolent, and intentional breach of law undertaken with the aim of bringing about change in laws or government policies believed to be morally wrong. Okay? That's what we're talking about. That's what we read about in the, uh, the three things that we've talked about. These people who are involved in civil disobedience believe in the rule of law. Now, when we say that is, the rule of law means when you have a law, if there are not consequences, it's not a law, it's merely advice. And, for example, when the law says 55, and if you drive 70, and the police officer comes up and says, <clears throat> oh, uh, you know, you're doing 70, the, uh, the speed limit's 55, you believe you ought to show down, slow down. If you don't get a ticket to get cited into court, it's just advice to drive that fast. There has to be sanctions with law. And people who are involved in civil disobedience recognize that. They're not trying to tear the place up. What they're trying to do is get something changed, and they are willing to accept the consequences of it. Daniel did. The three Hebrew children did. The apostles did. They accepted the consequences of the law. Carl Mankey is the example that most of us are familiar with here. Carl believes that the, the uh, order that keeps uh, barbershops and salons closed is unjust and unnecessary. Not that he, uh, if, you, if you've been there, you will know. He invoked their, their social distancing, their masks, and all that kind of stuff. And he's saying, I need to make a living. I have a right to make a living. And, and so uh, there is a social protest. Incidentally, this time, it was in a paper last night, the uh, state Supreme Court has ruled in his favor and thrown his back. That uh, got to be a full hearing on um, but these are, are things that we do. Now, what's happened here is, and again, we're trying to apply this to what's going on, the suspension of our rights during this pandemic has become problematic. First of all, has been the uneven, unfair uh, opening of things. Um, you, you could go to Walmart, you could go to Home Depot, uh, and yet you couldn't go to church. Now you take a look here, where we are right now, how you're spaced and everything. I, I've been to Home Depot, I've been to Myers, I've been to uh, Walmart, and I can tell you, people are close, are, are this spaced out all over. Of course, people would say I'm spaced out anyway. But, <laughs> uh, but, but we can do it. Why can't we assemble? I find it interesting uh, that that we have these. Uh, you can't uh, go to a church. You can't can't have more than a hundred people in a church. But they got thousands of people on the streets rioting, and nobody's doing anything about it. That's right. Okay, it's just that, and what that's doing, it's creating problems. Uh, there there are charges. Uh, that the uh, dishonesty with the data. Uh, and I, the problem that I have with this is you hear so many stories and we don't know what truth is. All I can tell you is it's out there that the data isn't honest. Now, that's going to create distrust regardless of what's going on. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, furthermore, as we have the declining rates of new cases, uh, declining rates of death, uh, uh, increasing rates of recovery and whatever, uh, they, it, it's beginning to raise the question of the need to continue these things. Now, uh, that's going to go across the board. Uh, some people are risk takers. Uh, they don't think we should have done anything in the first place. Other people uh, are scared to death and uh, whatever. We've got, we've got a rise here. But 
what we're doing is as this has as these uh, things have happened, people are getting restless and beginning to uh, question the need for it. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. The other thing uh, is that the motives for maintaining the shutdown are in question. Now, I try and do my best to give everybody the benefit of a doubt, but there are some evidences that uh, the, the shutdown is being handled in a way uh, for political purposes. Now, I can't help that. That's just what it looks like. And all I'm saying is that we may see more civil disobedience. Okay? That's all I'm saying. Uh, those things are the realities that we're living in. Okay? Now, having said that, as Christians, as Christians, we looked at what the Bible has done and said about civil disobedience. We need to be clear on the moral principle or principles that are being violated before we engage in civil disobedience. Okay? Just no knee-jerk reaction. Don't like this. Don't like that. Whatever. No, 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 no. There has to be a specific moral violation, a reason to do it, and we've got to be intentional. That's what the Bible's teaching us, is it not? Is that not what I read? Yeah. And so what we have here, we as Christians have got to be careful that we don't get caught up in all the, the fire and brimstone of what's in there, get stirred up by what's in the news or whatever. We've got to be very clear what we do. Okay, make sense? Yes. At the other extreme is rioting. Rioting is radical protest. Now you have to understand something about rioters. They are lawless. The scripture teaches that uh, in, in uh, 1 John, it says, those that sin are, and your, your translation will say, without law or lawless. Now, the Greek is anomia, without law. They have no boundaries. First of all, they have bought into the secular humanist point of view says, first of all, politics are all that matter. Second, secular humanism is the religion we have. Secular humanism, of course, says that man is capable um, uh, by reason and by the scientific method to solve all of his problems. And thirdly, moral relativism. There is no standard of morality. Throw the Bible out. We don't need it. What's right for me is right for me. What's right for you is right for you. And if I think we need to tear the place apart, it's okay. There is no law. And that's why our streets are overrun with anarchy. They're lawless. If, perhaps, it is based on moral values, it is rebellion to overthrow the government. Case in point, the American Revolution. Okay? Extreme violence, intimidation, force are all components of the, process, of the protest. Looting, property destruction are simply thuggery. Okay? Simply thuggery. People don't like to say it, but I was uh, surprised in my research found out that rioting is a form of terrorism. Now, they don't want to use that term because it's so inflammatory. Well, I'm going to have to tell you something. My mommy raised me to say, put the right name on. And whether we like it or not, they're out there a bunch of terrorists 
trying to intimidate and terrorize people to take to get their point of view and their way of doing, and they're going to do it, scaring you absolutely to death. It's terrorism. Furthermore, this is how you know it's not right. Rioters seek to avoid the consequences of their actions. I read in the paper last night, or no, it was, I guess it was on YouTube, that the Hollywood elite, whatever they are, are bailing out the riot. They're trying to avoid consequences. They don't believe in what they're doing. They just want to steal shoes and jewelry and clothes and uh, whatever else they can get away with, not work for it. They're thugs. But they try and avoid it. This rioting that we are experiencing is not moral out. It is merely people who are trying to take advantage of a difficult situation. It's sin. Amen. These people are someday, mark it down, I don't know what the long-term consequences will be, but I will tell you this. Payday is someday. Yeah. Yeah. And there's going to come a time when all of these thugs are going to stand eyeball to eyeball with Jesus. And they're going to have some tall splaining to do. Let's land. The church is to be the conscience of the nation informing all institutions when they violate the principles of righteousness and justice. You see, that's why they want to shut the churches down. Because the church is the institution in our nation to call everything out. Remember, the anti-slavery and the war, the civil war. That anti-slavery movement started in the churches, calling a nation's uh, calling a nation's attention to the injustice of slavery. It came in the churches. But if we can silence the churches, then we can silence our conscience. Mark it down, church. We have a very important role. A role that most of these people want shut down. We may need to protest and engage in civil disobedience from time to time. It happens. The Bible covered it. However, riot is sinful, and we will call it as such. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we've done our best to teach your word. We've done our best to, uh, to give what you laid on our heart for us. Father, have mercy on us. And simply, simply, please, um, help us, help us to be a light in a very dark time. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> this is the first Sunday of the month. We're going to have communion. Um, Chuck, could I have you come, please? Now, uh, what we have are cups that you 
simply take one. There is a little bit of cellophane on the top that covers the bread, and then underneath that you peel off, and it takes the juice, okay? Um, the getting the cellophane off the top, some people will do it real well, and some of us spent five minutes in the last church service trying to get this cup open. So, uh, I will simply warn you, but uh, that's where we are. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we thank you for the shed blood, broken body of Jesus Christ. Father, you said that this is my body broken for you. And Father, today we focused in on our sins as a nation and we have, we have sinned greatly. We simply come before you as we take communion, pleading the body that was broken for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Father, you said, Jesus, you said that the cup was the blood of the new covenant in your name. That the covenant of remission of sins. Oh, Jesus, please. We want to renew our covenant with you. We want our covenant to uh, be strong. We want you to know that we've had it in the past and we want to continue it in the future. In Jesus' name. Incidentally, when we're done, there's a waste paper basket out there for you to dispose of your materials. took the bread and he broke it and he said this is my body which is for you he took the cup and he said this is the blood of the new covenant, the remission of sins in my name. As often as you drink it, do it in the 
remembrance of me. Understand? Hymn number 584, I would be true. for the beautiful opportunity to come together again as a church body to honor your son. Thank you for the fellowship. Thank you for the message we received today as we struggle as a country with these injustices that pastor has talked about today. We ask that the holy word of the holy Bible surround this entire country we ask for healing, we ask for blessing, and all these things we ask in your Son, Jesus, precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. As you go this week, follow the Word. Live the Word. But most of all, go in peace. Be at peace. Be a peacemaker. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Yeah.